Good morning from Washington, D.C. Good afternoon uh, to all our viewers in Europe and hello to viewers all over the world. I'm Fred Kemp, President and CEO of the Atlantic Cl Council. I'm pleased to welcome you to today's edition of Atlantic Council Front Page, our premier platform for global leaders tackling the challenges of our times. Today's Atlantic Council Front Page is a particularly timely and significant one. We are joined by NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg from the Alliance's headquarters in Brussels. This is the Secretary General's first live interview since NATO and the United States delivered their written responses to Moscow's security demands of December uh, as he leads the Alliance through one of the most perilous moments in recent history. Secretary General Stoltenberg, we are honored, as always, to welcome you back to the Atlantic Council, NATO's home in Washington, D.C. The specter of a major conflict in Europe is more present today than it has been at any time since the end of the Cold War. The Russian buildup of forces on Ukraine's borders is a threat not only to the territorial integrity of that country, it is a direct assault on international norms of national sovereignty and self-determination. The stakes are generational. At this crucial moment, we are eager to hear the Secretary General's perspective on this Kremlin-generated crisis in Ukraine how NATO is responding, the implications for the new NATO strategic concept, and what is next for the alliance itself. To moderate today's discussion, we are delighted to welcome Margaret Brennan, CBS News' exceptional chief foreign affairs correspondent and the, moder and the moderator of Face the Nation. To our audience, thank you all for joining us from all over the world for this important discussion. Today's event is a continuation of the robust and multifaceted Atlantic Council coverage of the crisis. Please visit our website, atlanticcouncil.org, for expert analysis and breaking commentary. We are broadcasting live on Zoom, as well as the Council's website, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook accounts. I encourage all of you watching to join the conversation on social media using the hashtag ACFrontPage and hashtag NATO. And now, Margaret, over to you. Thank you so much, Fred, uh, and good morning to everyone watching here stateside. Good afternoon to you, uh, Mr. Secretary General. Uh, I don't really need to introduce you, but uh, of course, um, for anyone watching, Jens Stoltenberg is the Secretary General of NATO and has been since October 2014, following a distinguished international and domestic career, including as Prime Minister of Norway and UN Special Envoy on Climate Change. Uh, but now I, I would say, Mr. Secretary, you have a tremendous challenge in front of you at this moment. Uh, we have heard from Russia in their public communications so far that what NATO and the United States put on the table did not address their chief security concerns. Russia's forces continue to build in the region. At this point, can NATO deter a Russian invasion of Ukraine or is your aim simply to contain the conflict from becoming a regional war? Our aim is, of course, to convey a clear message to uh, Russia, and that's exactly what we're doing, that if they uh, use military force against Ukraine, it will have severe consequences. NATO allies uh, are ready to impose uh, heavy economic uh, sanctions, political financial uh, sanctions. Uh, NATO uh, provides support to Ukraine. Uh, we. We help Ukraine uh, with uh, modernizing their defense and security institutions, and NATO allies provide trainers' equipment. So uh, uh, Ukraine can also impose, co impose costs on, on Russia uh, uh, if they uh, once again invade uh, Ukraine. And then uh, uh, thirdly, and, and most importantly for NATO allies, is that, of course, we are also uh, uh, ready to um, step up, uh, as we actually now do, uh, our military presence in the east and part of the alliance uh, to uh, prevent any misunderstanding or room for miscalculation about NATO's ability and readiness to protect and defend uh, all allies. So we are, we are doing three things. We are uh, 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 sending a message of sanctions, high price to pay. We are supporting Ukraine, and we are of course also uh, 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 convey, conveying uh, uh, absolute uh, uh, un uh, un unwavering commitment to all NATO allies. But have you seen any concrete indication to date that Russia is backing down? 
What we have seen uh, is uh, a continued military build-up by uh, Russia, uh, and of course that is something we follow very closely. Uh, they are deploying more troops, more heavy equipment, and now also thousands of combat-ready troops to to Belarus, also with uh, with uh, aircraft, helicopters, uh, and advanced uh, weapon systems, S-400, uh, and other uh, weapon systems into Belarus. Uh, so the military build-up uh, continues. At the same time, uh, Russia uh, was willing to meet us, uh, the United States and uh, NATO allies, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and that's a good sign that, uh, that we sat down uh, in the same room and for hours addressed uh, 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 the situation in and around Ukraine and the security consequences for, uh, uh, for all of us, for Europe. Um, but also uh, that uh, we have now uh, conveyed our um, written proposals, um, how we right. believe it's possible to find common ground on everything from arms control to transparency on military activities to, to, to more uh, lines of communications between NATO allies and Russia. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and now uh, Russia has to assess these proposals uh, and, and, and we are ready to sit down with them, uh, sit down with them uh, when they are ready to continue uh, the efforts to find a diplomatic political solution. Ukraine's foreign minister said today they believe they could take the next two weeks to continue talking. Do you think you have that kind of time? So we have that time um, uh, as long as Russia does not once again decide to use military force. Uh, you don't see there's that no as imminent? Certainty. Well, there's no certainty about the, uh, the Russian plans uh, and uh, maybe they have not made any final decision. Uh, from the NATO side, we are ready to engage in political dialogue, but we're also ready to respond if Russia uh, chooses uh, uh, an armed conflict, uh, confrontation. Uh, so we, we are ready for both options. Uh, we are working mm -hmm. hard uh, for the best uh, peaceful political solution, but we're also prepared for the worst. Um, uh, uh, Russia once again uh, using force against the neighbor Ukraine. In terms of preparing for the worst, um, you said earlier this week that the NATO response force, uh, which is a force of about 5,000, could be deployed within days. Given the wide array of potential actions that Russia could take, exactly what is the threshold for their deployment? Have the allies agreed on exactly what would trigger that? First of all, the NATO response force is only one of uh, the elements in what we do to uh, provide credible deterrence and defense uh, to all NATO allies, and especially uh, those allies in the uh, east of the alliance. We have already, uh, after uh, Russia used force against Ukraine in 2014, for the first time in our history, deployed combat-ready battle groups, uh, NATO battle groups in the eastern part of the alliance in the Baltic countries and, uh, and Poland. Uh, we have air policing, uh, both in the Black Sea region mm -hmm. and in the Baltic region. We have uh, a more naval presence. And over the last uh, weeks, we have actually stepped up the number of planes and ships in these different uh, uh, missions. Then uh, we have um, the NATO response force. The total amount of troops there uh, is around 40,000. But the lead element of the NATO response force is exactly, as you say, around 5,000. Um, okay. That's a political decision. We will, we will assess, we will make our decisions uh, when we uh, see any need to further increase the presence in the east, uh, either by deploying uh, the whole or elements of the NATO response force, depending on uh, what the situation is, uh, and or uh, uh, also we're also considering to deploy <coughs> or, or to have battle groups, not only the Baltic countries and, um, and in Poland, as we have now, but also uh, uh, France, uh, the United Kingdom and other allies have also indicated willingness to, to have similar battle mm -hmm. groups in, in the Black Sea region uh, under NATO command as part of a, a NATO presence. Let me also add that, for instance, now we have, a, for the first time in decades, we have a U.S. aircraft carrier under NATO command, right. uh, and we have uh, more naval and air assets in the region uh, available if needed. If needed. In terms of that quick quick response, the, the response force you talked about, the 5,000, it's currently led by France, uh, along with allied troops in it. 
France is three months away from a presidential election. Are you concerned that politics will complicate the willingness to respond? You said it's a political decision to take the vote to deploy them. Are you concerned? So France is a, a very committed NATO ally. France has high-end capabilities. Uh, France has also de demonstrated over many years the ability to also uh, uh, deploy forces if uh, needed and to engage uh, in uh, difficult uh, 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 conflicts and, uh, and, uh, and uh, address many challenging situations. So, so I'm absolutely confident that France, but also the other allies in the lead elements, we call it the VJTF, the lead mm -hmm. elements of the, of the NATO response force, uh, will be ready to uh, deploy if needed. But we are at, at the same time pursuing the diplomatic uh, track, right. because the best solution will be to prevent any uh, uh, intervention into uh, Ukraine. And, uh, and, and therefore, we are sending the strong messages of of uh, um, also severe consequences or high price to pay for Russia, but also the fact that we have now seen an increased support to Ukraine. Uh, Canada just announced, uh, for, an exa for, for example, mm -hmm. more trainers to Ukraine. So the Ukrainian troops, the Ukrainian army, is much better trained, much better equipped, and much more ready now than they were in 2014. And of course, right. that will really uh, uh, impose costs on uh, Russia if they decide uh, to move into Ukraine once again. Right. For Ukraine to defend itself. But as you know, I mean, di diplomacy is most uh, powerful when there's a credible use of force behind it. So that's why I'm asking you about that decision. I mean, if it has to be put to a vote among allies, are you confident? Do you know what that threshold is that would get all allies to agree to use uh, that response force? But we will never give any potential adversary the kind of uh, the privilege of defining exactly the threshold. What we will do is that we will always uh, be sure that we have the necessary forces in the right place at the right time to defend and protect all allies. And we have done mm -hmm. that for more than 70 years. And the success of NATO, the strongest alliance in history, is that by standing together, uh, based on the principle, uh, an attack on one ally uh, will uh, trigger the response from the whole alliance, so one for all, all for one. We have been able to preserve peace, uh, to prevent any attack. Uh, yeah. And uh, I'm absolutely certain that we will be able to do that also in the future uh, with the NATO response force, but also with the forces we already have in the eastern part of the alliance, the increased naval and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and air presence. And of course, also the fact that the United States uh, has over the, uh, the last uh, uh, months and years increased its military presence in Europe, which is adding up to the total strength of uh, NATO in Europe. Mm -hmm. Well, President Biden also, as you know, put on notice that 8,500, uh, those 8,500 US troops. Um, but as was made clear at the State Department yesterday, the US can sometimes move more quickly, according to the State Department. And that's why the US is talking to countries about unilaterally sending in troops to NATO's eastern flank. So doesn't this send the message that uh, America is looked to to be that first quick reaction force rather than NATO? Does, do you support this kind of unilateral action? But the strength of NATO is that we bring 30 allies together and we coordinate their efforts. And sometimes we do this they do that in their national capabilities uh, on bilateral uh, what should I say, uh, agreements. Sometimes this is done within the NATO framework, but still we speak about NATO allies uh, protecting each uh, other. Uh, NATO is already in the region. We already have uh, uh, assets both on the ground uh, in the Black Sea region and the Baltic right. region. Uh, we have uh, air and sea uh, 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 capabilities there with the uh, standing NATO naval forces that have now actually received more ships from uh, Spain, uh, from, from Denmark, uh, planes from, uh, from the Netherlands, uh, also from, uh, uh, from Denmark and other countries. So, so, so NATO is already there. Uh, we have the uh, the high readiness uh, force that can be deployed within days. We have mm -hmm. actually increased the readiness levels of uh, NATO's response force, the lead elements. Uh, we did that uh, uh, several weeks ago, so, so, so they are prepared to deploy uh, uh, quickly. 
And then on top of that, we have national capabilities, not only from the United right. States, but also from, from other uh, allies. Uh, so and, are, and, you saying, and, are you saying that Romania and other countries that the United States is talking to do not need this unilateral support from the United States that NATO forces are sufficient at present? I'm saying that uh, we are coordinating closely what we do as NATO and what individual NATO allies do uh, together with other NATO allies. Uh, and, and the most important thing is that the totality of that uh, uh, delivers the necessary deterrence and defense. We will, of course, uh, constantly assess the need to adjust, uh, adjust our presence, also in the Black Sea region. We have already increased our presence in the Black Sea region over the last uh, uh, days and weeks. Uh, 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 we have increased the readiness of our uh, forces that can quickly move into the region if uh, needed. And then on top mm -hmm. of that, we have allies like uh, France, like uh, UK, but also United States, looking into uh, 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 adding more national forces. Uh, but also they can, uh, after the initial deployments, come under NATO command. So, 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 so we are coordinating very closely all allies uh, uh, both the things we do together as allies and, and the, uh, the, 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 the things we do on the bilateral level. And the U.S. aircraft carrier, which originally was under U.S. command, is now under NATO command. But, mm -hmm. but the reality is that we speak about the, the same capabilities, the same countries, uh, uh, and, and, and the most important thing is that we have those capabilities. But as you know, Mr. Secretary General, there's been a lot of reporting about differences of opinion among allies, particularly the willingness of France, the willingness of Germany to use force in the same way that the United States and United Kingdom might be more willing to act. So do you believe that you, have, you can deal with those kind of divisions um, and that you have agreements, even if you don't want to spell them out to us today, but agreements on what the threshold for action would be. But I think we need to understand that these troops that we deploy uh, in Romania, uh, we already have troops in Romania, in the Black Sea region, uh, in, in, in the Baltic region, they are there to defend NATO allies. And, that, and that's an right. absolute 100% uh, guarantee from all allies, including, of course, of course Germany and France. Uh, Germany actually leads one of the battle groups in the Baltic region, uh, the battle group we have in Lithuania. So there's no way Germany cannot be part of that because they're already there. Um, um, and, and France is also part of our deployment in the eastern part of the alliance. And, uh, and France is then now considering to add more troops. This is about defending NATO allies. And, mm -hmm. and Article 5, uh, the, the commitment to defend all allies, one for all, all for one, that's, 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 in a way, enshrined in our founding treaty, something we have been committed to, all of us, uh, for more than 70 years. Then there is an other issue that's also important, but an other issue, that is what kind of support do, do we provide to Ukraine, which is not a NATO ally, but a highly valued NATO uh, uh, partner. There, there are some differences between allies. I don't, I don't, I don't uh, uh, try to uh, hide that, but that's a very different thing than mm -hmm. the commitment uh, to protect and defend uh, all allies. So when you speak about the NATO response force, the NATO battle groups, uh, the increased air and sea presence in the standing naval forces, that's about defending NATO territory, 100% agreement, no doubt. When it comes mm -hmm. to uh, what kind of support we should provide to a, a partner, Ukraine, yes, there are some differences. Some allies are not ready to provide, uh, for instance, uh, lethal aid or, or military equipment. So NATO provides something uh, as, an, as an alliance, uh, capacity building, cyber, uh, uh, helping them to modernize uh, their, uh, their security institutions, uh, share information, uh, and so on. And then some other allies, uh, especially the United States, Canada, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, are also providing trainers, uh, uh, defensive weapon systems, and so on uh, to Ukraine. But, but I think it's important to distinguish those two uh, tasks. Right. Support to Ukraine, yes, important. Uh, 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 the commitment to protect and defend allies, that's our core task, and it's absolute commitment from all allies, and Germany and France is part of that. But what I hear you saying there is that the intention of a deployment would be to contain the possibility of a regional conflict that would affect your members, not to deter Russia from attacking a country that is not a member, although a valued partner. Is that correct? 
It's correct that we are not planning to deploy NATO combat troops to Ukraine. And neither uh, is the United correct. States. But don't you think, in, and neither is the United States, President Biden has made that clear. Mm -hmm. And that has been one of the criticisms of, of NATO to date, that um, because going back to 2014, the United States and NATO were not willing to, to use force to deter um, aggression and annexation of territory from a NATO partner. I know not a member, um, but that Vladimir Putin saw that and that he knows now there was not a willingness to use force uh, to stop him. Um, why should he take NATO seriously now? So first of all, because our main task is to protect 30 allies, 1 billion people, uh, uh, territory in North America and Europe. That's our core task. And we uh, demonstrate once again our commitment and our readiness and uh, the capabilities uh, to defend and, uh, and, and deter any uh, uh, attack against NATO allies. So I am absolutely certain that uh, President Putin and Russia takes NATO very serious when it comes to our ability to protect and defend uh, all allies, and we, and we demonstrate that every day. Uh, when it comes to Ukraine, uh, I'm absolutely certain that Russia understands that they will have to pay a high price, mm -hmm. um, because they, um, after they used force against Ukraine in 2014, uh, we uh, have imposed severe sanctions on uh, Ukraine, and uh, we have stepped up our support uh, on on you know, sanctions on 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 Russia after after the use of force against Ukraine. We have provided support to Ukraine, stepped up that, and we have uh, increased our presence in eastern part of the alliance. So, right. if uh, with bat groups and more military presence in eastern part of the alliance for the first time in our history. So, if the if the if Russia wants less NATO at its borders, they have actually achieved exactly the opposite. And if, and if they use force again against Ukraine, they will uh, achieve even more NATO at their borders. So, so, so that's, of course, a price for Russia, meaning that there have consequences if they violate international law, if they um, invade another country. Uh, but the consequences are different if they invade a partner, Ukraine, than if they invade a NATO ally. Uh, and, I, and I think it's important to, to understand uh, those differences. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and what is NATO's core responsibilities? As you know, French President Macron famously said to, about two years ago that he thought NATO was brain dead. Um, given what you were sketching out right now, do you think Vladimir Putin has unintentionally succeeded at giving you sort of new purpose and revitalizing the alliance? Well, I think the purpose of NATO has been there uh, the whole time, uh, because uh, in an unpredictable, unstable, more dangerous world, it's even more important that, that we stand together, uh, that we protect each other. We need strong international institutions as NATO in a time right. of uncertainty. Um, I think we have demonstrated that in also during the Cold War, of course. We, we demonstrated that when NATO helped to end the uh, brutal wars in the Balkans in the 1990s. I think we demonstrated that when NATO allies went into uh, uh, and helped uh, the United States in Afghanistan mm -hmm. after 9-11. And I think we demonstrate that now as we speak uh, with uh, the aggressive actions of, uh, of Russia against Ukraine uh, and the need to uh, provide 100% security guarantees for all uh, NATO allies. So, so NATO is the most successful alliance in history uh, because we have been able to be united and we have been able to change when the world is changing. And that's exactly what we are doing now. Well, speaking of a changing world, you mentioned cyber. Uh, the Ukrainian government has been clear that they expect a cyber attack to precede any kind of, of kinetic attack. Um, you said a few years ago, a cyber attack on a member state would trigger the collective defense clause, Article 5. Um, how do you plan to handle a Russian cyber attack on a non-member state now? Um, and Ukraine said Russia already carried out an attack just within the past few weeks. Is that kind of thing just below NATO's threshold to do more to respond? We don't trigger Article 5 in response to an attack on a non-NATO uh, 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 country. Why I, that's why uh, I just asked the question. Us. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. why I'm asking. So, so, yeah, but what we do is that we help them also with their cyber defenses. Uh, and, uh, and, and NATO 
and NATO allies provide significant support to Ukraine, both to bolster their cyber defenses, uh, uh, to share information, uh, and and to, 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 to share best practices. And, uh, and we have just signed an agreement where we actually step up uh, and, 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 and create a framework for, for more uh, support, uh, helping them with their uh, cyber defenses. Um, the more general, the message is that we, we have actually decided that, that, uh, that an attack in cyberspace can trigger Article 5. Um, and therefore, uh, we are ready to respond. But that can be in cyberspace, but it can also be in another domain. That's for NATO to decide, right. depending on what kind of attack. Let me ask the question another way. When Russia carried out a cyber attack in Ukraine in 2017, not Petya, it was an attack on Ukraine, but it had global uh, impact, I mean, on companies, on countries around the world. So it did impact countries beyond the target of Ukraine. Is that kind of scenario something you're thinking about now? If Russia attacks Ukraine and the fallout from that attack impacts your member states, what should NATO do? So first of all, it is extremely important that we are prepared for uh, also cyber attacks and the consequences, as we saw uh, uh, some years ago when, when Ukraine was attacked, but it had consequences for many other countries, as you said, all around the world. Uh, this is partly about strengthening our cyber defenses ourselves. It's about uh, 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 improving the way we uh, share information about uh, uh, cyber attacks and improve the way we attribute. Because one of the challenges with cyber attacks is that uh, 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 those behind very often deny that they are behind in the cyber attacks. So attribution mm -hmm. uh, to actually identify who is behind is one of the main uh, challenges we are working on as NATO allies uh, to respond uh, to cyber attacks. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and also NATO allies have also increased our ability to, uh, to, to what we call national, to provide national cyber effects, meaning also to, uh, to push back in cyberspace if needed. But I'm a bit afraid of going too far in speculating. I was reluctant to be, go too far mm -hmm. in speculating because the aim now is to try to uh, reduce tensions and to, and to uh, uh, convince uh, uh, Russia, we call on Russia, urge Russia to sit down and engage in, in talks to prevent these kind of scenarios uh, so we can find a political uh, solution. I know we have some people standing by to ask questions. Just to, to put a fine point on what you just said, um, do you disagree with Ukraine's assessment that Russia carried out the attack, the cyber attack, two weeks ago? Or are you just saying you don't want to answer that question? I'm saying that we are not going into details about our intelligence, uh, mm -hmm. but we are very much aware of that Russia has been responsible for uh, cyber attacks before, and they can, of course, be uh, responsible for that again. And, of course, as a kind of uh, first step or a precursor to a, a kinetic military attack, uh, a cyber attacks is a very likely scenario. And let me also add that one possibility is a full-fledged Russian invasion with tens of thousands of combat yeah. troops, heavy armor, planes, uh, missiles, and all the stuff they have lined up uh, along, along the borders of, of Ukraine. But there Understood. are also many other ways of, uh, for Russia to conduct aggressive actions. Cyber is exactly. one. Uh, coup, uh, efforts to topple the government in Kiev, sabotage. They have intelligence uh, officers working inside Ukraine as we speak. Uh, so we need to be prepared for a wide range of different uh, uh, forms of aggressive actions by Russia against uh, Ukraine. Mr. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, Anna Palacio is standing by with a question. Anna? Well, thank you, Margaret Brennan. And uh, it's a great honor and a great pleasure, uh, Secretary Stoltenberg. I'm speaking from Madrid, where NATO will meet in June to define the new strategic concept. And my question is, after the chaotic exit from Afghanistan and the bitter fighting between allies on budget, and frankly, the, the already mentioned comment by President Macron about NATO's vitality, uh, NATO is again back front and center of the geopolitical arena. And I would like you to tell us, forward-looking, 
What are the lessons about allied political unity that could be included in the next strategic concept from this experience? Let me first say that I'm very much looking forward to attending the NATO summit in Madrid in uh, June. Uh, and uh, uh, Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez uh, and the whole uh, Spanish government and the people of uh, Spain uh, uh, will be great hosts. Uh, and, uh, and that's something I really look uh, forward uh, to. Um, uh, second, I believe that the Madrid summit will be a very important summit for many reasons, but not least because, as you said, uh, we will uh, agree uh, a new strategic concept for NATO. The last time we did that was actually 10 years ago, and the world has changed so much, so we need to update uh, the strategic thinking and the strategic concept of, uh, of uh, NATO. Uh, then, uh, and then this concept will cover many issues, but on your question, I think the most important lesson we can learn from all these events uh, you mentioned is the importance of North America and Europe standing together. Uh, because uh, when we face new threats and new challenges, a more uh, assertive uh, and aggressive Russia, uh, uh, cyberspace, terrorism, uh, but also, of course, the security consequences of the rise of China, uh, it is even more important that we have North America and Europe uh, not apart, but together. Because as long as we stand together, we represent 50% of the world's economic might and 50% of the world's military might. So, so when we are together, we can tackle any challenge, any threat. Uh, and I think that's also important for the United States, because uh, uh, it's good for the United States to have 29 uh, friends and allies. Uh, sometimes they are concerned about the size uh, of China. That, uh, of course, China is, uh, no, the United States is big, but not that big compared to, to China. But if you add all NATO allies, uh, then, uh, then we are really big and strong together. So, 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 so I think the most important lesson is NATO and Europe together. Thank you, Anna, who is the former foreign minister of Spain. Uh, I want to move to our next questioner, Elena Tregub. Uh, if you would introduce yourself and ask your question now. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Secretary Gen Mr. Secretary General. I'm Elena uh, Tregub. I lead a civil society organization here in Ukraine, advancing good governance in defense sector. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to ask you a question. I was uh, wondering, uh, in your opinion, do you think it is possible to uh, change the narrative uh, about NATO and Ukraine to reflect their reality here on the ground? And the reality is that Ukrainian people want to move uh, into NATO and Ukrainian people put pressure on our politicians, no matter who's in power, to get us closer to NATO. While Russia uh, sees the situation differently, uh, that NATO is advancing towards Ukraine. Uh, do you think if Putin believed that the desire to enter NATO comes from Ukrainian people, not the elites, he would act any differently right now? NATO has never and will never force any country into uh, the alliance. Our door is open, but we will never force anyone into that door. Uh, so the enlargement of NATO that has taken place over uh, yeah, many decades uh, is a result of democratic uh, decisions uh, by the people, uh, by the peoples in free nations. Uh, so it, rep it represents the will of the people in all those nations who have uh, decided to join uh, our alliance. Uh, that was the case when NATO was founded back in '49, and that has been the case for each and every country, from Spain to, to Poland to, to, to Hungary to the Baltic countries, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, recently North Macedonia and Montenegro and many, many others. Uh, so uh, we... Uh, and, and, and also, I'm, and, it, and it's so obvious that those who try, in a way, to tell the other story, they know that they're not telling the truth, uh, because uh, um, it is, it is, it is. The fact is that countries have become members of NATO uh, through uh, through uh, their free, independent uh, decisions.
Thank you. Um, and next question comes from Gabriella Doyle. If you would introduce yourself and ask your question. Thank you, Margaret. Mr. Secretary General, it's an honor. My name is Gabriella Doyle, and I'm an assistant director with the Atlantic Council's Transatlantic Security Initiative. To some viewers, the crisis in Ukraine may seem like a far off possibility, yet its implications may affect all of us. What would you say to Americans in all 50 states and commonwealths about NATO's value and role in the world, not only in managing the current conflict with Russia, but also in terms of what NATO can offer American communities? I think that two world wars and the Cold War taught us that uh, peace and stability in Europe is not only good for Europe, it's also good for the United States. So, um, um, of course, NATO um, and the American security guarantees to Europe, they have been important for uh, European allies. But uh, that is also extremely important for the United States. Peace, uh, security, um, is the basis for prosperity. So for ordinary Americans, uh, it is extremely important that NATO is the foundation for peace and stability in our part of uh, the world. And uh, this has been demonstrated over decades, and especially for the United States, after 9-11, uh, we invoked our collective defense clause, and uh, uh, tens of thousands of uh, European, Canadian, non-US NATO uh, soldiers, uh, personnel have served uh, shoulder to shoulder with, uh, with American uh, uh, soldiers in Afghanistan in a re response to an attack on the United States. And then also, as I mentioned, uh, when it comes to China, of course, uh, China will soon have a bigger economy uh, than the United States. The biggest, also China will have the biggest economy in the world. They all have the uh, largest defense budget they are leading within many technologies, like uh, parts of in, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, parts of quantum computing, and they already have the biggest navy in the world. Uh, so, um, compared to China, it is a great advantage for the United States uh, to have something that China and no other major power has, and that is many friends and allies. It's good to have friends. It's good to have allies. And that's exactly what the United States has in NATO. And that's also why uh, NATO is important for people in the United States. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, there is a question coming in from someone watching at home. In a worst case situation, should Russia attack Ukraine, could there be, in theory, a speedy accession for fully fit countries like Sweden and Finland, should they wish to join NATO? <clears throat> so NATO respects decisions by sovereign independent nations. So we respect them if they apply for membership, um, uh, but we also respect if they decide not to apply. And therefore we respect the decision uh, that uh, uh, Finland and Sweden has taken so far not to apply for membership. If, and then we work closer with them. Finland and Sweden are our closest partners. We, we train together, we operate together. Uh, uh, we have improved what we call the interoperability of our forces, so we, we can operate together, uh, uh, even though Finland and Sweden are not uh, NATO members. And I spoke recently with the Finnish president, I spoke with the, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the Swedish prime minister, and they conveyed very clearly this message that they're not applying for membership, but for them it's absolutely unacceptable uh, uh, what uh, uh, Russia now demands, that NATO should close the door forever for every potential member. Because then, then Finland and Sweden will lose the freedom to, at the later stage, choose uh, NATO membership if they so want. So this is about the sovereign right of every nation to choose its own path. If they decide to uh, apply, and that's a 100% Finnish and Swedish decision, then I think um, it is possible to... Uh, uh, to, 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 to make a decision quickly and, uh, and, and for them to join quickly. At the end of the day, this has to be a, a political decision, but when you see the high level of um, uh, interoperability between uh, NATO and uh, Finland and Sweden, when you see to what degree it, they already meet NATO standards, uh, uh, it should be possible to allow them into our alliance uh, 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 quite quickly. We have time for just one more question. Um, 
there is some speculation that Russia will not invade and disrupt the Olympics in China. Do you put credence in this? And can you explain how NATO sees the relationship between Russia and China? First of all, we have a lot of intelligence. We are monitoring very closely what is going on in and around Ukraine. We see a continued military buildup. We see the threatening rhetoric, and we also see the track record of Russia uh, being willing to use force against uh, Ukraine before. But at the same time, uh, we have conveyed the message that there will be a high price to pay for Russia if they uh, do so, and, 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 and Ukrainian forces are much stronger now than uh, back in 2014. And we are pursuing a diplomatic path uh, uh, with Ukraine, uh, with, with Russia. We have just uh, conveyed our written proposals. The reason why I say this is that I will not speculate. I, I, I just uh, tell you that we are prepared uh, both for a scenario where Russia invades uh, uh, or a scenario where they actually uh, decide to sit down and engage in good faith in talks with NATO and NATO allies. So you don't see coordination between the two countries at this point? Uh, sorry, uh, that, that was the other part of the question. Yeah. No, what we see is that Russia and China are uh, uh, becoming closer and closer. Um, they uh, exercise together, they, they, they operate together, they, 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 they stand uh, together, uh, for instance, more and more in the UN, in the UN Security Council. Uh, so these are two authoritarian regimes that, that, that do not share our values when it comes to democracy, the rule of law, the rules-based international order. And of course, that adds to the concern uh, that uh, these two countries are uh, uh, becoming closer and closer, uh, both when it comes to military but also political cooperation, and they, and they crack down on democratic opposition. Uh, in their respective uh, countries. So, so, so all of us who believe in, in, in the rule of law, in democracy, in the freedom of press, uh, we need to stand together. And that makes uh, NATO just even more important that uh, uh, in a time where we see authoritarian regimes um, stepping up, uh, it is even more important that we, that we um, stand together as NATO. Uh, both when it comes to the deterrence and defence, but also uh, on our um, diplomatic efforts to find political solutions and to engage in dialogue with Russia, now on Ukraine, and uh, with China on arms control and many other issues. So, so, mm -hmm. so, so NATO is ready for dialogue, um, especially in light of uh, the challenges both China and Russia poses to the rules-based order. Mr. Secretary General, thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments about the free press as well. Um, and that concludes our Atlantic Council front page event today. Uh, thank you for being with us during what is an incredibly busy and important time for you. And the Atlantic Council's programming uh, will continue to follow this ongoing Russian aggression in and around Ukraine. And that'll continue in just about 15 minutes at 9.30 a.m. Eastern when we will hear from former NATO Supreme Allied commanders in Europe, and uh, they will answer questions about how the Alliance can enhance collective defense and prepare for further escalation. So thank you all for tuning in for this event. I'll see you Sunday.